Thank you, Miss Stacy and Dad and Roger Dale. Those, we sing those songs. That's like going to battle war songs for me. When I sing, I think in my mind, I'm going to battle right now behind this pulpit for King Jesus. Yeah. Well, we're back in John after another exciting week in the life and times of Philip and Christy. <laughs> so you look to chapter 4 and verse number 1. We've arrived at the story of the woman at the well. Now, most of us know this story. It's a simple, very straightforward story. It's the story of Jesus evangelizing an outcast woman, her coming to salvation, and then her being used by God to bring many other people to salvation. If you scan down there to verse 39 here in chapter 4, you'll see that fact where it says, From that city many of the Samaritans believed in Him, look at this, because of the word of the woman who testified. Now that's speaking of our woman at the well. What we have here is as clear a model of Jesus evangelizing a sinner as we have anywhere in all of the Gospels. So, you think about it, it definitely should be a point of instruction for us as to how we are to approach the unbelieving people in our world with the gospel. Now, having said that, let me continue to remind you also of the bigger picture purpose that John has, that he's given us in writing the gospel of John in the first place. He gave us that great purpose statement. Look there in John 20. Verse 31, the purpose for John writing this gospel. But these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's the purpose statement. John's primary purpose in all of these verses that he has written is to continue to unveil Christ to us. To continue to unveil Christ to every single person throughout the history of the world who picks up the Gospel of John to read it in order that we might believe in the person and work of Christ, which produces on His terms life, eternal life forever. And in continuing to put Jesus on display in this text, we continue again to encounter both the humanity and the deity of Christ. Remember that word deity, it's used in many ways. Oftentimes I find myself looking at crazy stuff on History Channel like the ancient aliens. And I sit there and watch that because I'm so interested in seeing how much craziness people would rather believe than the truth. So they will use the word the deities, you know, deity with a small d, deity, meaning the gods, which they refer to, little g, g-o-d-s. But when we speak of the deity, there's only one deity, Amen. right? One deity, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, three persons. So that's what we're talking about, the humanity and the deity, the Godhood of Jesus. For example, in His humanity, as God in human flesh, we're going to encounter Him here very weary, very thirsty, slumped over at a well. But at the same time, so interesting in this passage, his deity is also on display. As we see him meet this woman, this woman that he has never before ever met 
in his life. He's never seen her. She's never seen him. She's never heard of him. She's never encountered him. And he tells her the whole story of her life at this well. So you have humanity and weariness, deity and omniscience all in one person at this well who is God in human flesh. Let me tell you something. Only God can tell you your whole life story before he ever meets you. No one else can. Only God does that. Now, up until this point, John the Baptist and John the Apostle and the disciples of Jesus, we've seen this already in our study of John so far, have all given testimony from their own words that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. But in this text, we encounter the first time that Jesus himself proclaims his own Messiahship. We're going to see that down in verse 26 where he says to the one, and I who speak to you am he. Another one of them great I am statements. Now, what makes this so unique is that this declaration that Jesus gives of his Messiahship is not given by Jesus to any of the religious leaders in Israel. It's not given in the city of Jerusalem. The first time that Jesus announces his Messiahship from his words, it's given to a woman who is in every sense, as we're fixing to see, an outcast of society. This woman is a Samaritan. Samaritans were essentially a corrupted form of the Jewish race. Historically, when the Assyrians came and took the Jews captive and removed them from the land, there were Jews who remained in the northern kingdom. And what happened when they remained? They intermarried with all sorts of pagan, idolatrous nations around them in absolute, direct disobedience to God. And so they then became a hybrid people who had forsaken their Judaism and had committed the most heinous crime that a Jew could ever commit. And that was to mingle themselves with the idolatrous Gentile nations and people around them. You remember how serious God was about that in the Old Testament. But not only was this woman an outcast, she was also a very immoral woman. She had been married five times, and at the present time, she was living in an adulterous relationship with another man. This woman is uneducated. She doesn't know anything about true religion. Jesus even tells her at some point, we're going to get there, you don't know what you worship. And she is also an indifferent woman. She's not like Nicodemus that we studied in chapter 3. She's not seeking Jesus when she comes to this well. <laughs> Remember, Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, having seen the miracles of Jesus and knowing, as he said, you obviously have been sent from God. This woman hadn't seen anything. She knew nothing about Jesus. She never heard of Jesus. And she is religiously indifferent. And she has no idea as she approaches the well, who in the world is this Jewish stranger sitting at the well today? She's from the bottom end of a corrupted culture and society. And she is a pariah even within her own group of people. She's the very opposite of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was moral and religious, the most upstanding kind of Jew. He's devout. He's respected by everybody. And he seeks out Jesus. Remember from chapter 3, he wants to understand, how do I get into the kingdom? This woman here, she is 100% the opposite of Nicodemus. And yet, please take note. 
It is to this woman that Jesus first in the gospel of John declares his own identity to this woman. This is a testimony, first of all, to the apostasy of Israel. It's a stinging rebuke to Israel that this revelation was not made to any religious leader in Israel, but instead it's given to this woman. But more than that, this is a declaration on the part of Jesus that he has come to this world to save people from every tongue and tribe and nation across this globe. It is a testimony to salvation for everybody who believes. Now, you know this. Israel as a whole, not every single person, but as a whole, the nation of Israel rejected her Messiah. They murdered him, put him to death. And then judgment became very clear, very harsh upon the nation for that rejection as the Romans in 70 AD leveled it to the ground just as Jesus perfectly predicted. And this declaration by Jesus, along with other places in the New Testament, makes it very clear that the gospel is for everybody. I don't care what your background is. Look at my background. If it can be for me, huh? it could be for anybody. That's why the Great Commission says, take the gospel to every nation. Go to the ends of the earth to Every creature proclaiming the only truth that there is that makes a person right with God. Now, this encounter that Jesus has with the woman at the well is really more in line with what we encounter when we witness the gospel of Christ to people. It's rare, is it not, that you have in your day-to-day life Somebody come up to you like Nicodemus and say, hey, can you tell me how to enter the kingdom? How often do you have that happen? (laughs) Hey, can you tell me how to be saved and get right with God uh, when I die? I mean, it happens, but it's very rare when it does happen. And let me tell you, it's getting less and less as less people are going to church now in our country. And this country becomes more and more secular for the most part. What I'm here to tell you today, we can learn from this, is that we are going to take the gospel to the world. We are going to have to initiate a conversation, a gospel conversation with people who are at best indifferent to the gospel. Now, more than likely, here in America... We are either going to run into people in our world who are either embroiled in a false system of religion that is not the truth, or mostly what we're going to run into are people who have concocted their own faith and their own system of understanding of who God is and how He operates instead of defining who God is and how He operates according to Scripture alone. That's mostly who we're going to run into, especially here in South Louisiana. So this encounter is going to teach us how we are to approach people in the world who are indifferent to the gospel. And again, here we have a woman. She's not looking for Jesus. She didn't know who in the world he was. At first, he had to have certainly seemed a bit strange to her, especially what he starts out saying. But that's only how it starts. And the first thing we can learn from Jesus here is that Jesus, as he encounters this woman, he just dismisses her indifference. It's not at all a barrier for him to keep him from talking to her. And he dismisses her ignorance. That is not a barrier. And watch this. He even dismisses her immorality. Even that does not stop him from talking to this woman. It's not a barrier for him at all. 
For sure, in this new political climate that we find ourselves here in our culture today, it's very, very easy for us to have resentment, especially to people on the left who are absolutely corrupting our culture, destroying our country, corrupting our young people. It's very easy for us to have resentment for those who advocate for abortion on demand right up to the point of actual birth, homosexual marriage, transgender rights, along with the people who engage in those behaviors. And it's right in certain situations to take a public stand against all of that and call sin, sin and proclaim Christ as King and Lord over all things, over all nations. And I get that. I'm right there with you. I mean, you've watched me do that publicly as pastor of your church. But the reality is when it comes to the gospel, they are not the enemy. They are the mission field. You understand that? Yes, sir. You have to keep both those things in balance, okay? They're all sinners. Listen to this. They're all sinners just like all unbelieving, pro-life, pro-biblical marriage, Christless conservatives are. We got a bunch of them. A bunch of them. Conservative values, closer to the values of God, yes, but without Christ. Without Christ as Lord. And listen to me. That's not to say that we do not do all that we can to keep these lunatic leftist people with such rank on biblical anti-Christian positions out of uh, political office with our voting and our engagement in the public square. Yes, we do do that, but that's a whole separate issue. That's a different conversation right there. Lost people who reject Christ and His way to salvation on the right and on the left and those who don't care either way are all our mission field. Amen. When it comes to the responsibility Amen. to go into the, all the world and to bring the gospel message to every tribe and nation and tongue on the face of the earth. We just have to keep all that stuff in balance. We can chew gum and walk at the same time with this stuff. Now let's look at this instructive moment verse by verse, starting with the setting in verses 1 to 3. Look there with me. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went away into Galilee. So Jesus leaves Judea. For Galilee, north, leaves Jerusalem. Remember from our study of chapter 3, he's been preaching repentance and preaching the kingdom and baptizing just exactly the same as John the Baptist. And remember, in this time period, their ministries were kind of overlapping one another. And remember that John went north to get out of Jesus' way while Jesus was in Judea. The crowds are getting bigger and bigger and, and, and even more people than what John the Baptist had been getting. And it says that here in verse 1. And it says that the Pharisees had heard about it. In verse 2, it's kind of like an edit given by John the Apostle. That Jesus himself was not doing the actual baptizing, but his disciples were. You remember what I said about that? That was for obvious reasons. So that nobody could say, I got baptized by Jesus himself. Who did you get baptized by? So Jesus did the preaching and the disciples did the baptizing. So the ministry of Jesus now is really starting to flourish. But as you know, this starts to create problems. Think about it. The Pharisees already hated John the Baptist. You remember what happened when the Pharisees came out to the River Jordan? To see John the Baptist, what, what happened right when those religious leaders of Jerusalem first pulled up? You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Why are you even out here to hear me preach, right? And then Jesus not only had the same message 
about their apostate religion. He had also just cleaned house in the temple prior to going on mission in Judea. So they weren't real happy about that either. The Pharisees were like the watchdogs of everything religious, and they were watching over their turf. And so right away, their hatred was mounting and building against Jesus. And at this point, Jesus just wanted to avoid a premature confrontation with them. There, there, that wasn't time for that right now. He's just getting going, and there was much ministry left to do before this thing escalated. And so he leaves Judea in verse 3. He goes back home to Galilee, where he would minister there for well over a year, far away from Jerusalem and the Pharisees. Now, you need to understand, if you got a map in your Bible of Jesus' time, you can turn to it. To get from Judea in the south to go to Galilee due north, you had to go through Samaria. So Judea, Samaria, Galilee. Technically speaking, you didn't have to because you could have gone over to the coast and then gone up and around uh, Samaria. Or you could have gone the eastern route, gone over the Jordan and gone up and around to get there because Samaria was that strip of land in the middle. And let me tell you, that's exactly what every serious-minded Orthodox Jew ever did when they wanted to go up there because they didn't want to get defiled by going through Samaria. They didn't want to get defiled by having Samarian dirt on their sandals, which would make them unclean. And it's interesting to note that verse 4, look at it, says he had to pass through Samaria. Literally in the Greek, it was necessary and yes, it was the shortest route. But let me tell you more than that. He knew because he's God in human flesh. He knew that he had a sovereign appointment with a woman by a well that was not only going to lead to her salvation, but an entire group of people from a Samaritan village. So when the Bible says he had to go that way, I'm telling you, he had to go that way. Verse 5. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, verse 6, and Jacob's well was there. So if we assume that Jesus was in or around the Bethany area, it was about a 20-mile hike up to Samaria. And when I say hike, I don't mean a flat walk like from here to Zor. This would have been up and down and up and down 20 miles. How many of you think you could walk up and down 20 miles today? Huh? Not many of us. This place is also identified by letting us know that this is where Jacob purchased land and dug a well and gave that land and that well to his son Joseph. And Joseph, of course, was later buried there. I listened to R.C. Sproul preach through this this past week, and he said, think about this. That well, Jacob's well, had been functioning for 2,000 years from the time that Jacob Sir. dug it up to this moment we come Sir. to right here with the woman at the well. And guess what? The well is still there today. You can go visit it on a tour to Israel. So Jacob's well, as proof of the Bible of many proofs, Jacob's well has been there for 4,000 years. The Bible is true, just identifying our historical geographical location. That's, the Bible loves to do that. You know why? Because it's a real book about real people doing real things in real places. That's what the Bible is. So this spot was probably about a half mile or to a mile away from the village of Sychar. And Jesus gets here after this 20-mile hike up and down through the hills. And verse 6 goes on to say, So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Notice it says, Jesus being wearied from his journey and sitting Thus, and that means in a wearied condition. 
He sat in a slumped, a weary condition by the well. He wore out. It's about the sixth hour. Now, we don't know what time of the day he started out, but the day started at dawn for most people in that culture around 6 a.m. So the, the, the sixth hour was around, it was at noon, Jewish time. So Jesus has just had this hot, long, rigorous, 20-mile hike up and down the hills, and he gets to the well, and he slumps down at the well, and he is exhausted. The Greek word for wearied here means to be to the point of sweat and total exhaustion. You can see him there, slumped at that well. Extreme weariness. He sits down on the edge of this well, and now the stage is set for this amazing encounter. And again, we see very clearly here the humanity of Jesus. Did you know he understands what we suffer because he was one of us? He knew what it is to be weary, to be thirsty, to be worn out. And yet he created the world and everything in it. Just think about that for a moment. And here he is by this well. And the first point I want to give you in this lesson on personal evangelism is this. Unexpected condescension. And what I mean by that is Jesus takes the initiative and comes into her world. Look at verse 7. Starts out with, there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Now in the ancient world, drawing water was women's work. The men worked in the field. They did all the hard labor and the women drew water and took care of the home. This is a desert area and they drew water every day because they needed water every day. Water was scarce in this part of the world. It was a very important component of day-to-day -day life. So wells were visited every day. And so this was a common meeting place for the women. And, and what's interesting here is that they typically came, the women of the village, at dusk. They came when everything had cooled down in the evening. And so we have to ask the question, why is this woman coming at noon? I mean, we know here in South Louisiana in the summertime, noon is where you start getting to the hottest part of the day. Well, we can't be for sure, but it's reasonable, very reasonable to assume that this woman had a pretty bad reputation in her village. Five husbands and currently living with a man in adultery that everybody knew. It's a small village. Now, the Samaritan religion was based on an understanding of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament and the Ten Commandments and the positions therein on marriage and divorce. So this woman would have come at noon because she knew this was a time when none of the other women would be at the well, when she could be by herself to draw her water. Maybe she just wanted to avoid the shame and the possible confrontation that she knew she would encounter from other women who knew her reputation very well. Now understand, especially in this society, even Samaritan society, this woman is not a respectable person in the village. So more than just with uh, your average person here, this is a condescension on the part of Jesus to give her his attention. And how does he start? Well, look next in verse 7. He takes the initiative. They're both there. And he speaks up, verse 7. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. J.C. Ryle says this, this is a gracious act of spiritual aggression on the sinner. Love that line. We don't think of, about aggression in terms of evangelism, but maybe we should. Hmm? And what Jesus does here is a shocking thing. 
Not so much in our culture, of course. But back in his day, this was very shocking because men just didn't speak with women in public at all. Ladies, you start to think you're getting it, have it hard in that regard. Go back to those days. The women really had it rough. And especially, especially a rabbi. A rabbi never, ever, ever spoke to a woman in public. This was a serious breach of religious etiquette. Jewish rabbis were not even supposed to talk to the women of their own family in public. Serious no-no. So just... Think about it. Put yourself back here culturally at the moment at this well. Here's Jesus. He's a rabbi. He's a Jewish man. And he not only talks to a woman, which is shocking enough in itself, he talks to a woman who is a half-breed pagan Samaritan. And worse than that, by every measure, she's a well-known adulteress back in the village who probably had been a the adulteress for a very, very long time, hence so many divorces. Because the law of Moses, divorce was granted, and Jesus reiterated this, for immorality they were granted. So here we have a very immoral woman. It's a shocking breach of everything Jewish for Jesus to turn to this woman as she approaches the well and say, give me a drink. And somebody might say, well, why didn't, why, why not just ask the disciples? Well, he can't ask the disciples because look at verse 8. For his disciples had gone away in the city to buy food. So he's at this well alone. And it's fixing to become pretty obvious to all of us that that is exactly what he wanted. Just as a footnote here. Scan your Bible. Jesus never did a miracle to quench his own thirst. Jesus never did a miracle to satisfy his own hunger. Jesus never did a miracle to provide anything for himself ever. He honored work. He honored effort. He honored care and sacrifice and giving and all the things that we do to sustain ourselves. But he never did the kind of miracles that would supply his own needs. So, this woman next responds to Jesus. Let's look at her response in verse 9. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman. And then John, the, the, the writer, asked parenthetically, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And that phrase, literally in the Greek, the verb there is, they don't use the same utensils. Literally, use not anything together with Samaritans. They don't use the same things. They don't drink out of the same cup. It's very specific they would defile themselves by drinking out of the same cup. She's saying, hey, I know your culture. I know what you think about us. And by the way, Jesus has shattered that because that all was non-biblical Jewish tradition that had been added to the Old Testament by the Pharisees of this time and this time in history. That kind of hatred toward the Samaritans that came from the Jews was wrong. They should have been the mission field for the Jews. But at this point in Israel's history, we got a whole nation of Jonahs in Israel. They didn't want to take the message to those Samaritans any more than Jonah wanted to take the message to whom he was commanded to take it. Here we have the Samaritans. Instead of telling them the truth, instead of going into Samaria with groups of people and trying to draw them to the true knowledge of the true God through the scriptures, how did they treat the Samaritan people? With scorn and disdain and they hated them. And guess what? This woman knows that. She's lived here all her life. She knows they're not supposed to share anything. 
And she says, look at it. How is it that you being a Jew? Now, how did she know that he was a Jew? Well, probably from his clothing. Jews had distinctive clothing. They had tassels on the ends of their garments, especially the rabbis had those tassels at the edges of their garment. And Jesus (laughs) has now violated all expectations by simply even talking at all to this woman. And just notice how indifferent Jesus was. I love it, toward all the non-biblical traditions that they had tacked on to the Bible. He sent the disciples, think of this, into a Samaritan town to buy food. They were going to eat Samaritan food bought out of the hands of the Samaritans. They went to Raising Cain, Samaria and got food. Jesus didn't care anything at all about the tradition of the Jews. That was wrong. It was anti-biblical. He only cared about the revealed truth. And that's how we need to be today, folks. We don't need to care about all of the traditions of false religion. We don't need to care about the politically correct positions of this ever secularizing culture that we live in. The only thing we need to care about is what the revealed truth and truth alone says in this Bible alone. Away with all the rest of caring about any of the other opinions. And when those Jews created these kind of traditions, they just shut the Samaritans off at that point. And when they did, you know what they were in violation of? God's will, God's heart. God had to send his Messiah to do what these people would never do, to what the religious leaders of Israel would never do. So Jesus starts the conversation with an utterly indifferent, immoral woman. That's the first part. Unexpected condescension. Condescension, that's where this starts. Let's go to number two unsolicited mercy. Unsolicited mercy is offered to this woman. Look at verse 10. And while you're looking at verse 10, just take note of the fact Jesus doesn't say one word about the conflict between Jews and Samaritans. It it doesn't even come up. Verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink. You would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Oh, let me tell you. He wasn't obligated to tell her that, was he? No, he was not. That's unsolicited mercy using physical thirst and water as the contact point. And Jesus here now reverses the situation. He's tired. He's weary from his hike. He starts out thirsty and he asks her to give him a drink of that water out of that well. And then as Jesus often does, he turns the table right over and identifies her as the thirsty one. You're the thirsty one. And he, he is the source of the water. And she really doesn't know where he's going with this. She doesn't realize this is pure mercy from God himself, because she said, he, Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God, oh, evangelism can start right there. He has initiated a conversation. He found his way to a common point of interest, and then comes the reality, that is, what is being offered is mercy. Notice here, there's no regard for religion. There's no regard for, for morality, nothing like that is being spoken about. Right at this point, it's just grace. It's the gift of God. This is the unique glory of the centerpiece of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In opposition to all religion. As I tell you all the time, 
Every other single solitary religion in the history of this world says, do this, do this, do this, do these works, do these works, and then God will let you into heaven, and then God will bless you. That's not Christianity. You don't have enough good works to get right with God on your best day. You couldn't possibly because his standard is perfection. Jesus said, be thou perfect, either as my Father in heaven is perfect. Anybody got there yet? You're not ever going to get there. That's why you need his righteousness, because you don't have any. The gospel says in whatever state you are in, religiously, in whatever state you are in morally, here is a gift. On Christ's terms, of course. But a free gift. The gift of God. It's a gift of grace alone. It's a gift of mercy. The Greek word here is literally free gift. Here it is. You going to take it? Paul loves this word. He uses it in Romans to make clear the emphasis. Verse 10. If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have Asked him. Remember what we said when we were going through regeneration in John 3? Regeneration is solely a work of God. You can't participate in your own spiritual birth any more than you can your own physical birth. All you can do is ask. Jesus said, there is a gift from God. And I'm here to give it to you. If you just ask. He's dealing with her at this point before repentance and faith comes into play. We're just dealing with grace right now. The free gift of salvation that leads to repentance and faith. He's speaking in the third person concerning himself. Look at it. You would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And with that statement about living water, now he turns this conversation in a very strongly spiritual direction. And now we're talk, not talking about the water that we started out talking about. Now we're talking about living water. And you can imagine at this point, she might have thought living water was just the, the water that was in that well because that well was spring fed and 100 feet deep constant water from the time Jacob dug it to 2,000 years later when they're sitting at this well. But Jesus, he's saying something different. If you only knew what God is offering you. Oh, God is offering you living water. If you only knew that, you would have asked. And if you knew that I, I am the only one who can give it. Nobody else can give you this but me, Jesus is saying. And here I am, sitting in front of you at this well. If you would have asked me, I would give it to you. What is this gift of God? What is this living water? It's salvation. It's the only way you can be made right with God through believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ and being right with God when you die. It's the only way to go to heaven when you die. It's everything that makes up salvation, grace, mercy, pardon, forgiveness, justification, and it flows endlessly for all people who die outside of having salvation in Christ and they have to stand before God and every person will stand before God and give an account of what they did with their life that he gave them. For sure, you can be for sure about this, their law breaking, breaking his law over and over and over, millions and millions of times in their life, that will be a part of what brings about their condemnation in hell forever. But in the big picture, I'm here to tell you this today, in the final analysis, their condemnation will be the result of rejecting the free gift of God in Jesus Christ. Not asking for the gift. 
You know what Jesus said? You will not come to me that you might have life. You know what people say today? I will not have that man to rule over me. There's got to be some other way. Not his way. Or they make up some confused way that includes him. The New Agers and the cults and all the rest. That's not his way. They only use his name. James said, you have not because you ask not. Jesus is telling this woman, oh, if you could only grasp this gift. If you could only understand what I'm saying and who it is that's talking to you right now. You would be asking me. And guess what? I would be giving it to you. That's the uniqueness of the gospel. It's the free gift to anyone who asks Romans 10. What does it say? Some people who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Is that what it says? Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And of course, that's not just with intellectual faith. The devils believe in their brain and they tremble. That's on Jesus' terms of repentance and faith. And notice Jesus calls this water living water. It's a great analogy. They're at the well. In the world in which they lived, again, water, man, was crucial. It was a, Can you imagine today if all the water in Central turned off and you couldn't go to Walmart and get bottled water? We would be in a bind, right? And there would be some chaos going on in Central. And water is used this way all over the New Testament. Like in Isaiah 55, 1, look what it says. Ho, everyone who thirsts comes to the waters. This means water is life. You draw your life from God. Later in John 7, 37, Jesus says, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Verse 38, He who believes in me, as the Scripture said, from his innermost being will flow Rivers of living water. That's right out of Isaiah 2. Down a little further, we're going to see it in John 4. He tells the woman, verse 14, But whoever drinks of the water I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. That's the perseverance of the saints right there. That's the security of the believer right there. Once you receive this water, once this water is placed in you, guess what? It flows forever. It's a well of water that continuously springs up forever, eternally. It never stops flowing. One day Jacob's well is going to stop. Not this water. Not this well. This is the gospel, folks. Mercy without regard to religion. Mercy without regard to morality in order to get you right with God as if you think that could somehow do it. You just start out, out by asking for this free gift. And if you do, that leads you to repent of your sins and place your saving faith in the person and work of Christ alone for salvation. Well, she's trying to figure out what in the world is this guy talking about? Look at verse 11. She said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? And really, that's just sarcasm. It's kind of mockery, right? No, no. You have to grant this poor woman was very used to having to defend herself probably all the time. So, you know. That's a quick response from her. Verse 12, You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? In other words, who do you think you are, strange man sitting by the well I come to every day? You think you got something better than this? How are you going to get me that water? You don't even have a bucket. How are you going to drop the rope 100 feet down there and pull that water up with that rope. Do you have some other well? Are you greater than Jacob? Skepticism. Mockery. But you know how the mercy of Jesus responds? The mercy of Jesus responds kindly and patiently to this woman. Look at verses 13 and 14. 
Again, Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Again, that is the eternality of salvation. And that leads us to a very brief third principle in evangelism. We're going to close here with this. Unparalleled blessings promised. Here in verse 14, Jesus promises an endless supply of satisfying water forever, and he gets specific. He's talking about eternal life. His point is unmistakable. This is permanent, consistent, full, satisfying, everlasting mercy and blessing from God to the sinner who asks. That's what it is. The analogy has now moved to its point. The doctrine is the doctrine of eternal life. He is offering this immoral outcast woman eternal life, the gift of grace, living water. And she responds in verse 15. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. Now, that's interesting. Kind of looks like she still doesn't get it, huh? Give me this water, she says. And what you can feel from her words here is this. Who is this man? What is he talking about? What's going on with her here? Is she getting some of this, maybe? Maybe. Is she starting to think right here at this point in terms of spiritual things and eternal things? Maybe. Or is this just mockery more slightly? Or... Is it mingled with her because she's not sure? We don't know right here at what point she is as the Spirit of God works on her heart through the words of Jesus. We don't really know at this point, but it all comes very, very clear in the next section the next time we're here in John. So you'll have to come back to hear the rest of the story. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this day. Incredible story of Jesus teaches us so much about our own need to initiate conversation, especially in this culture in which we live, to have gospel conversation. Lord, we are... We are a people who have come to recognize the authority of your word as your word alone. No other words are your word. And in it, the main character, the Lord Jesus Christ, our King, creator of all things. John said earlier in chapter 1, nothing has been made that he didn't make. He made all things for his glory. And Lord, we praise you for King Jesus and the masterful way in which he dealt with people on this earth that should be used as an example for how we do the same in our brief time here in your world. Thank you for today. Thank you for your people being here today. We pray that every aspect of all that we have done in your house today has been done in such a way as to bring you maximum glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.